What a blessing it is each week to come together and to sing his praises and to sing and remember the riches of his grace, the greatness of his mercy, the wonderful salvation, the richness and the power of his word. In preparation to hear the word of God preached today, I'm going to ask you to stand in reverence to the word of God. And if you desire, you may open to Colossians chapter 4. This morning we will be looking at verses 7 to 12, but I'm going to read the entirety of the chapter, and then we will pray and look into this. Listen as I read God's word. Beginning in verse 2. Continue steadfastly in prayer, being watchful in it with thanksgiving. At the same time, pray for us also that God may open a door to us for the word to declare the mystery of Christ on account of which I am in prison that I may make it clear which is how I ought to speak walk in wisdom toward outsiders making the best use of the time let your speech always be gracious seasoned with salt so that you may know how you ought to answer each person Tukikas will tell you about my activities he is a beloved brother and faithful minister and fellow servant in the Lord. I have sent him to you for this very purpose that you may know how we are and that he may encourage your hearts. And with him, Onesimus, our faithful and beloved brother who is one of you, they will tell you of everything that has taken place here. Aristarchus, my fellow prisoner, greets you Mark, the cousin of Barnabas, concerning whom you have received instructions, if he comes to you, welcome him. And Jesus, who is called Justice, these are the only men of the circumcision among my fellow workers for the kingdom of God, and they have been a comfort to me. Epaphras, who is one of you, a servant of Christ, greets you, always struggling on on your behalf in his prayers, that you may stand mature and fully assured in all the will of God. For I bear witness that he has worked hard for you and for those in Laodicea and in Hierapolis. Luke, the beloved physician, greets you, as does Demas. Greet, give my greetings to the brothers at Laodicea and to Nympha and the church in her house. When this letter has been read among you, have it also read in the church of the Laodiceans. And see that you also read the letter from Laodicea. And say to Archippus, see that you fulfill the ministry that you have received in the Lord. I, Paul, write this greeting with my own hand. Remember my chains. Grace be with you. Please be seated. And let us pray. Lord God, as we once again give our time in this gathering to consider your word. Lord, we thank you for this time. We thank you for the confidence that we can have in the richness, the purpose, and the power of your word to accomplish its purposes. God, I pray that you would bless the things that we strive to consider today, that once again you would stir our hearts with a recognition of what you are, have been pleased through your servant to set forth. God, we pray that we would not remain unmoving. We pray that we would not simply understand it with our mind, but indeed you would by your word and spirit give us understanding and then work to make us and remake us in your likeness according to your word. Lord, thank you for this time. Bless your preached word and your people that you have brought. In Jesus' name, amen. So we take up today in verse 7. We are nearing the end of the book of Colossians. I expect, God willing, next Sunday will be the concluding Sunday in the book of Colossians. I've titled today's message, and you'll see this, Encouragement from an Eclectic Entourage. Eclectic means what? From a bunch of diverse backgrounds. These are a strange mishmash, to put it in more vernacular, of people. 
from all kinds of, of different groups, and yet there is much encouragement we see to Paul mentioned here. There is expected encouragement to Colossae mentioned here, and I am confident that there will be encouragement also to us as we consider this section of Scripture. Though it is just kind of, some people look at these greetings as a toss away. He's really finished everything he has to say and now just, hello you, hello you, hello you, goodbye you, goodbye you, the end. But we believe this, every word of God is profitable. And there is no accident in the inclusion of the greetings. Now there is uh, different degrees of profit, surely, and even as you look at the outline on the back of, of your worship folder today, some of you may look at it and be like, oh my, I shouldn't have planned lunch today. <laughs> well, don't worry about that. It, it, it won't take as long as it looks. Further, there will be no exams on who can pronounce these names correctly or remember each of these individuals. But I am confident that God has put them there for a reason. And I think there's something useful in the design of this because some of these people would have been known in Colossae and some of them would not have been known in Colossae. And I think it's important for us to understand this because somewhere, someday, you will meet someone who's going to say, my spirituality, my walk, it's between me and and Jesus nobody else it's just me and Jesus and they are just wrong <laughs> when we are brought into union with Christ we are bought, brought into union of the body of which he is the head and each faithful local church is an expression of that body we are joined to one another and there is a real sense in which we know there are some not here, but who are ultimately joined to the head who is Christ. They may be meeting in China, in Africa, in India, uh, uh, across the continent of Asia today, and they are in some sense connected to us and we to them. I love the words that we're given in Psalm 16.3 and the psalmist says this, As for the saints in the land, they are the excellent ones in whom is all my delight. It breaks my heart. I have spoken to people, and I'm sure you have spoken to some as well, who will say, well, I'm a Christian, but I just don't go to church anymore. I mean... I went to one and they said this, acted like this, did like that. It hurt me and so I'm not turning away from Christ. I'm not abandoning my faith, but I'm just not going to go to church. And again, part of the problem, it is very sad, but part of the challenge is that Christ himself, through the apostles, in the authority of the word, says, do not forsake or neglect the assembling of yourselves together. So you're kind of in a mess when you say, I'm following Christ, but I'm not going to do what he wants me to do. I'm following Christ my own way. Or, the things that work for me, I'm all in. The things that I'm not happy with or agreeable to, I'll leave that to others. They can enjoy that. That's not the way it works. And when I read this, the saints in the land, they are the excellent one in whom is all my delight. Do you have delight in God's people? There ought to be a richness of fellowship, a richness of encouragement, a richness in gathering. You know, and uh, Sometimes I wonder, what are these churches these poor people have gone to? Or, so many factors could come into that. But God has so designed it that those who love Christ, we have the same prevailing passions. And because we have the same prevailing passions, it's going to bring us a joy and a delight in one another. There's going to be a unity and an accord that we fit better with one another than we fit with anyone else. 
and there is joy, there is delight, there is comfort and encouragement in that. In Psalm 119, similarly, verse 63, it says this, I am a companion of all who fear you, of those who keep your precepts. I am ready to be a close companion and friend and walk with those who walk with you in your way. That ought to be us, right? The last verse by way of introduction, 1 John 3.14 says this, We know. And we know 1 John is full of by this you will know, by this you will know, to test whether or not you are in the faith or whether or not Christ is even in you. It says this, we know that we have passed from death into life because we love the brothers. Now some would say, hold on a second. We know we've passed from death to life because we love Jesus. Because we love God, because we love doing the right things, because we love getting our way. Okay, where did, how did that sneak in? Well, because that's kind of what it really is saying. Because if, if, you, if you have come from death to life, you will love the brothers. And this is my biggest fear and, uh, for those who say, I love me Jesus. In, and I, I'm walking with him, but it, it's personal and private exclusively. I don't want anything to do with God's people. You may not have been brought from death to life because it brings you to Christ and it brings you to gather with those who gather in the name of Christ. It brings you to walk with those who are striving by grace to walk that same narrow path. And we walk it together in encouragement and love. He then says, whoever does not love abides in death. Strong words. So now we take up this mishmash of men, right? This eclectic entourage because, and here it is, all men. Remember when we did Romans, there was a mixture of a number of women that were mixed in here. Here he begins to set forth men. One of the things, just by way of simple initial observation as we begin to break into this, to the church in Colossae, there are some who are with him who are from Colossae and that he's going to be sending there. He does not start with the men who is from them. He starts with a different man. So he doesn't start with a, you know this guy, he's one of you. He starts with someone else. Secondly, I want you to note this, he's going to mention a couple of Jews. And he does not start with the Jews. Those that would have been his kindred according to the flesh. In so, here's what happens, and you and I know it. We are all to some degree possibly prone to measures of, of nepotism now some of you are saying please explain that further we <laughs> tend to show favoritism to our own kind our own people you know and it can be seen even in simple ways maybe someone will show up from somewhere and say hey where are you from well I'm from California someone might say and another person say, all right, I'm from California too. And somehow there's this peculiar affinity, maybe. Um, and, and weird little things strike up an accord, uh, uh, an agreement, some sort of unity, however it may be, right? Or maybe it's from a particular place, a particular narrow place, city or town or county, or parish. And people, oh, you're from there. I'm from there, too. And, and there, there's that kind of, like, he doesn't start with that. He starts with somebody else, and I want us to begin to look at this, and you don't have to pronounce these things the way that they seem to have been pronounced in the Greek. It doesn't look that way in the English, but I've gone ahead and put the pronunciation in there for you, just for your own fun and enjoyment. 
the first fella, his name is Tukikos, which I will tell you honestly, I have never face-to-face met anyone named Tukikos. Tukikos has much to commend him, though I doubt you will name your next child Tukikos. And even though there's much to commend him, you probably won't be naming your pets this either. But listen to what we see certain things about Tukikos. Now, he's actually mentioned in five different verses in the New Testament. We're not going to look at all of them, but I want us to get a sense of who he is. And, and so um, we see in 2 Timothy chapter 4, verse 12, he says, Tukikos, I have sent to Ephesus. So here, he's sending Tukikos to Colossae. Another place, he's telling Timothy, I've sent him to Ephesus. So at least that you're picking this up. Tukikos is someone that Paul is sending to different places. Our best understanding as we look at these is he was one who would take these epistles that we now have in our scriptures written by Paul, and he would deliver it to Ephesus. He would deliver it to Colossae. He had the privilege of delivering God's word from an apostle to these churches. What a remarkable privilege. You know, for his sake, I would hope also he might get the privilege of reading it then out loud to the church. You know, and just, you know, hearing those things over and over again. It says, Tukikos also will tell you about my activities. So he's going to tell them about Paul's activities. And this is just something I want us to slow down because sometimes we can get more spiritual than the Bible. Not really. We think we are. (laughs) I don't want to talk about people and what's going on in their lives and their struggles. I don't want to know their victories and their failures. I, you know, because I'm not focused on men and earthly experiences. I'm all about eternity and Jesus. Oh, you're so wonderful. Uh, but what I want us to see in here. Tukikos is going to deliver the word of God to them, and certainly that is of primary importance. Unquestionably, he's not going just to give a report about Paul's practical experiences. He's going to deliver that word. But along with that word, he is going to be sharing Paul's practical experiences. The good and the bad. Well, why do they care about that? Because they care about Paul. Well, why do they care about Paul? He's a brother in Christ. For many of them, maybe like a spiritual father or grandfather in Christ. Why do I say grandfather? To our best understanding, if you remember, way back, Colossians 1, it seems the church at Colossae was founded by the ministry of Epaphras, who we'll see later in this, and that Epaphras was one who seemed to have been trained by Paul in the hall of Tyrannus. And so we have Paul preaching the word to the conversion of Epaphras, him receiving instruction, and then him going forward with that word and planting the church. Paul has longed to see them face to face, but had not yet. And I think this is lovely. They have never met Paul face to face. He has never met them face to face, but there is a real sense of unity, camaraderie, mutual commitment, and love. A care and concern. Sometimes the world may think that when we pray for missionaries. Many of the missionaries you've never met face to face or seen. But why do we pray for them? Because they are partners, co-laborers for the name of Jesus Christ. And we are concerned with the walk of our brothers and sisters. We're concerned when they face oppression and persecution. We're concerned that God would open a door for them for the ministry of the word, strengthen them in seasons of suffering and need. 
And we see he communicates that. He's going to tell you about my activities. In other words, we cannot become so insular and isolated to just think about us and our little locals. We do want to think about us and our little locals, but we want to think about others too. And we don't want to pretend to be so spiritually minded that we show no love and consideration and concern for others and their reality and their struggles and their their circumstances. Let's go ahead and begin to unpack Tukikos. He is born and raised in the Roman province of Western Asia minor let's begin to see a few things about him here and you see it in your outline he is referred to here as i read through it he is a beloved brother and faithful minister and fellow servant in the lord now the way that the grammar lines up there each of those descriptions are are in the same nominative case and so each of them connects to in the Lord so if you want to understand it correctly he's a beloved brother in the Lord he is a faithful minister in the Lord he is a fellow servant in the Lord now let me see if you've picked up my subtle hint what is it that ties them all together and brings them a sense of unity yeah in the lord it is those who are in the lord that that changes things he calls him a beloved brother is he paul's fleshly brother by no means he's not even of the same lineage he's not even of the same uh nation and people group he's completely other but he is still referred to here as a faithful brother why is that it is because he is a partaker a sharer in the same grace the grace of God that was poured out bringing salvation to Paul is the grace of God that was poured out bringing salvation to Tukikos which is the same grace of God that is poured out on any who have received salvation. We, when we are in the Lord, we are brothers and sisters in Christ. And it is this grace has been poured out onto us through Jesus Christ and his work. And so that he is the elder brother and we are all brothers and sisters in Christ. It brings this this rich sense of the household of God. And this is not normal. I don't know if you're aware of this, but there are apparently places in the world where people like to subdivide and segregate and separate and then hate. What a terrible thing. But even as we say that, that's always been the case. Throughout history, even moving forward, in the days of the apostles, there was still much natural division, especially between Jews and Gentiles. Don't think for a moment that was the only division. You would still have multiple subdivisions. People are always ready to build up barriers and build up walls. Remember, it was so strong in terms of Jew to Samaritan and Jew to Gentile, they would not even sit and eat with them. That's how strong the tradition was and we see even that still affecting years later in the planting of churches we see brothers came from James and Barnabas was even affected by this Cephas was affected by this so these are things we need to be aware of but further listen to the words by the spirit that Paul wrote to the church in Ephesus It says this in Ephesians 2, verse 14 and following. He, that is Christ, himself is our peace. We were, first of all, at enmity with God, and now we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ. He's the only hope of that peace. But when he reconciles us to God 
through his body and his blood, we are now united to him, and he has actually united us with others that we were at enmity with. Because let me keep reading. Who has made us both one. The us both is here Jews and non-Jews which is not something traditionally Jews would have been inclined for. He has made us both one and broken down the dividing wall, broken down in his flesh the dividing wall of hostility. So there was hostility between these two groups and Jesus in his body has broken down that dividing wall and now there is greater unity. In a real sense, we have greater unity than those who might share same flesh likeness. Because we share in the flesh and the blood of Christ Jesus that was given for his people. Let me keep reading. By abolishing the law and commandments ex and ex expressed in ordinances, that is again, bringing to completion the old covenant that separated them from the rest and establishing a new covenant in his blood that he might create in himself one new man in the place of two and so making peace and might reconcile us both to God through his body on the cross. And it says this then in verse 19. So then, you are no longer strangers or aliens but you are fellow citizens with the saints and members of the household of God. So our union with Christ brings us a union with each other that trumps, overcomes the idea, is more significant than the ideas of we're of the same nationality. We're of the same people group and heritage. We're of the same household and family the work of God in Christ surpasses that where it establishes a household of God and a unity in him that is the most glorious and ought to be the most unified group that exists on the face of this earth now for some of you that would not be a surprise you may be in holidays and other occasions you get together as a larger family and you say we are a mess <laughs> we, there's not a lot of unity that one hates that one you know and these two always start out not hating but end the day hating each other it, we we all kind of have those things that ought not be among us and I'm not going to belabor the point but the scripture takes us back why because we love one another, we forbear with one another, other, we forgive one another, there is, because we understand the extraordinary grace that is given us in Christ. And it says that he is a beloved brother. Let's not miss that. Beloved means there is an expression of love. We can call him a beloved brother in two senses. He is loved of God. Right? He is loved of Christ. He, secondarily, he is beloved by those who are Christ's. We ought all be beloved brothers and beloved sisters. We shouldn't have a list of the beloved brothers and sisters and the medium loved and the not loved. You know, that just does not work. Um, and we have to fight that tendency. Because let's not pretend that that tendency does not exist. Beloved brother, faithful minister. The term here that's for minister is actually the term diakonos, to which we often say deacon. Really, here it should say faithful servant rather than faithful minister. But the reason why it says faithful minister is because the next thing is fellow servant. And so again, they're linguistically just trying to play it a little bit better, but we're not worried necessarily about the beauty of the words, but that we accurately understand them. This is a guy who is a faithful servant. Who is he a faithful servant of? First and foremost, a faithful servant is a faithful servant of God. But more than that, 
Let me read for you, probably by way of reminder, Matthew 23. Jesus would speak these things into occasions where the 12 that he had chosen, who would become the apostles, we sometimes often think, what excellent men they must have been. Until we read the scriptures and we see what ordinary, weak, and sinful men they were and what a mercy of God to mark them out for himself and what a majesty of God to use instruments like them to set forth his glory and, and, and word of reconciliation. You know, it's, it's astounding. But listen, it says a faithful servant when they would argue about who is greater among us and this was one of their arguments i hope you have not had the same argument with one another you know so who do you think who's greater you or me you know when we get to the kingdom probably me right uh, do we have that i hope not i hope that we've learned enough from the scriptures but they would do that correct not only would they do that they would do that so strongly two of them would even send mama to go to Jesus to say, what do you think? <laughs> Top seats for my boys? <laughs> you know, this, and what did Jesus say? And I read for you Matthew 23, 11. It's in each of the Gospels. The greatest among you shall be your servant. What? I want to be the boss, though. <laughs> I want to be the one everyone looks to and listens to. You're telling me to look after them? I'm wanting them to look at me, and you're saying look after them. What's going on here? Well, we have a tendency to be selfish. We have a tendency to see things wrong. Jesus turns it around, and this fella is a faithful servant. Again, uh, here, here's what makes a servant faithful. If you tell the servant this, you know what? This party is finished and there's still two slices of cake, would you mind finishing those for us? The servant may say, I will do as you have asked, and he will eat that cake, and you might say, what a faithful servant. He has done exactly as I asked. Yes? Yeah, it, it, that was an easy one. When you, when, you, when you tell him, well, somebody had some sort of medical accident and they didn't quite reach where they wanted to reach in time there's a mess in the bathroom would you go sort that out oh my i'll eat two slices of cake for you but you want me to clean this what is a faithful servant the one who does only some things or the one who does whatever's asked of him no matter how undesirable no matter how filthy no matter how seemingly wretched if i do that i'm going to get my hands dirty if i do that this and a multitude of excuses could come no but what does a faithful servant do someone's going to be a faithful servant means this guy <laughs> Whatever I ask him to do, whatever I assign, would you go to Colossae? Would you go to Ephesus? I just made it back from the previous journey. Can I have a little bit of rest? Remember, they didn't have cars, buses, trains, airplanes. Journeys were arduous and difficult. Paul is in prison in Rome at this point. So when he would send someone with a letter, they, might, they would go. There would be journeys by sea, often with delays due to weather, and come back. They may, much of the travel might be three months traveling. They reach a place. They're there for a few days to deliver it. They head back, and then he might say, here's the next one. That's tough, isn't it? But he's a faithful brother. He's not thinking of himself first, but he's thinking, how can I best serve the Lord and be of service for the Lord in the lives of God's people? Now, be of service for the Lord in the lives of God's people does not mean every time there's something bad to be done, you know, at your house, something's gone wrong with the bathroom, uh, uh, let me call Jason because uh, 
you know, he's supposed to serve us. Um, please do not. <laughs> I would hope that I'd be willing, but I would recommend attempts yourself. Uh, we don't, the goal isn't to make other people our serve. What, what a beauty it would be if we're striving to outdo one another in serving one another. How different would that look to the way it normally looks? A faithful minister. Jesus says in John 12, 26, if anyone serves me, he must follow me. And where I am, there my servant will be also. If anyone serves me, the Father honors him. Simply saying that, because we like to be called Christians, maybe. We like titles of significance and honor or even of mutual affection, brothers and sisters. Servant is a humbling term. We should be very happy to be a servant. And also never forget this, John 13, 16, truly, truly, I say to you, a servant is not greater than his master. Always remember who our ultimate master is and what our place is. He is great. He is worthy of all service, no matter what sacrifice that might bring. Beloved brother, faithful minister, and fellow servant. This fellow servant ter term is also used in Colossians 1 of Epaphras, who founded that church. But it says this, the idea of fellow servant now, in your notes also, you'll notice this. When there's fellow and a hyphen, it's because it's a compound word in the text, and I'm giving that sense to you. The word here is sundulos. Doulos, many of us are acquainted with that term because it's oft-rendered servant, not strong enough. It's otherwise oft-rendered bond servant, which is still not quite strong enough, but the sense of a bondservant was one who has, because he owes a debt, or because of his love and affection for a previous master, sells himself and binds himself as a slave to that individual. So really, this term is fellow slaves. We are servants of God, but he, we are Slave. And here's the other thing I want us to note. Fellow slave. Wait a second. Paul, you're totally messing up the hierarchy. You are an apostle. You know, you are kind of the, the top of how it flows. You know, you have apostles and then bring it on down to all the lesser ones. You have the authority to speak on behalf of Christ. You have the extraordinary broad array, almost the totality of new covenant giftings given to an apostle, right? But Paul refers to Tukikos, which we don't know much about, other than he was a courier as a fellow slave, we are the same before God. We have different roles. You know, you may, have, again, even within the historic contexts throughout the world of slavery, you would have slaves that worked in the house and slaves that worked in the field and slaves that did different things, right? They were still all slaves. Apostle is a slave who does a different thing and has a different role and a different responsibility. But I love the beauty of that. He, I'm no greater than him. He's no greater than me. All of us find and understand who we are and what we're about as being entirely sold out to serve Christ. I mean, just a beautiful picture that the scriptures give to us there. Um, the last thing we see about Tukikos is he is, I call him an encouragement envoy. When I say that about him, it's also going to be somewhat true of Onesimus who's going with him. But what it says here in this passage, it says that um, I have sent him, verse eight, for this very purpose, that you may know how we are and that he may encourage your hearts. 
In Ephesians 6, when he sent him, he says, I have sent him for this very purpose, that you may know how we are and that he may encourage your hearts. The same thing, Tukikos is gonna be to Colossae and he's going to be in Ephesus to encourage their hearts. There's a little takeaway I take away from that. The church at Colossae, Paul wanted their hearts to be encouraged. The church at Ephesus, Paul wanted their hearts to be encouraged. We see that Paul and Barnabas went back through all of the churches that they have planted, encouraging their hearts through the word. Do you know what that tells me about us? We are regularly in need of encouragement. And that is spiritual encouragement in the words of truth. But beyond that, in hearing about what God is doing in the lives of others. I mean, he's going to tell you all the things with regard to Onesimus next there. It says, as it says at the end of verse 9, they will tell you everything that has taken place here. It is so encouraging to hear of answered prayer that people have been pleading. It is so, such a blessing to hear when God has granted someone to overcome an obstacle or granted them grace to resist a temptation. It's just so encouraging to hear those things. But how often do we just keep them to ourselves? How often do we just share them with our spouses? And that's it. And I'm going to encourage you and me, brothers and sisters, let's share more about what God is doing in our lives for, to encourage one another's hearts. Because this is a real thing that is spoken of here, and it strengthens their souls. So now let's move on to Onesimus. Onesimus, it says this, and with him, coming together with Tukikos, is Onesimus, our faithful and beloved brother, who is one of you. So Onesimus is from Colossae, as is another person who an epistle is being written to. If you're acquainted with Onesimus, then you're probably acquainted with Philemon. Because Philemon was the landowner, the master, and Onesimus was what? His slave who absconded. He took off. He ran away, didn't he? And so what, one of the things that I, I find interesting, and I always want to be careful about speculation, but I find it interesting, he's sending him back. I'm sending back Onesimus. That's what he's called here in one verse. He's actually mentioned, called that only once in Philemon. Onesimus, the meaning of that word means useful or profitable. You know, there's a little part of me that wonders, was that always his name? Or was that useless runaway? Uh, did Paul rename him when he came to faith? So that he would understand, you know, you who were worthless, you who were useless, you who were dead in sin and living for self are now alive in Christ. You are now useful in the hands of the master for greater deeds and greater service than you would have ever considered. Onesimus, now one who is. And I say that partly because listen to what it says in Philemon 1, 10 to 12. I appeal to you, Paul to Philemon, for my child, when Paul refers to someone as my child, it's, it's not because he is the father, but because he has had the privilege of sharing the gospel and then seeing God bring them to life. He has been that privileged instrument to deliver the word that then was life-giving in them. I appeal to you for my child Onesimus, whose father I became in my imprisonment. Formerly, he was useless to you. <laughs> but now he is indeed useful to you and me. 
So that's what, again, makes me wonder about that name, Onesimus. I am sending him back to you, sending my very heart. What a rich thing. Oh, that God would tie us together like that, that we would consider ourselves oftentimes so close and so affiliated to one another that it is our very heart. Um, Further, uh, he says this later in Philemon 1, if he has wronged you or owes you anything, charge that to my account. But he says this in verse 16, I send him back to you no longer as a doulon, no longer as merely a slave, but much more than a slave, a beloved brother. And I love the union of those two terms once again. I'm not just sending him back to you as a brother, but as a beloved brother, one who is loved by God, one who is loved by me, Paul, and one that ought also be loved by you, Philemon. And so just a beautiful thing. He is a faithful brother, one who had been unfaithful in his work, unfaithful to his master, is now described as a faithful brother. One, one, one who had been uh, uh, clearly uh, different and separate and estranged is now spoken of as a beloved brother, not merely a slave, but a family member, even one of you. And I love this as well. It says, verse, the end of verse nine says, they will tell you of everything that has taken place. Because here's what, I, it, again, hard maybe for us to see it in the sense of that society. Onesimus was a slave. He's not a person of significance, of bearing, of weight and importance. But he goes together with Tukikos and he will also be sharing. He has something to contribute He has something to participate. This seemingly useless, seemingly low, seemingly uneducated, seemingly outcast. Now I'm sending him back to you as a brother. And he's got something to say that will encourage you. Isn't that great? I I like that because no matter how low, how weak, how inept we sometimes may judge ourselves. We are loved of God. And the message that he's given us, we have the privilege of sharing it with others. The work he's doing in our life, we have the privilege of sharing. The things that we see his hand accomplishing, we have the blessing to make that known. Let's move on from Onesimus and look at Aristarchus. There in verse 10, says Aristarchus, my fellow prisoner greets you. So Aristarchus is also in prison with him. He's come to know, uh, Paul's come to know Onesimus in his imprisonment. We don't know if that's Onesimus visiting him uh, uh, or, or Onesimus was also in prison. We do know that Aristarchus is also in prison. Aristarchus is a Macedonian from Thessalonica. He accompanied Paul on his missions to Jerusalem. He accompanies Paul ultimately on his mission even later to Rome, regularly and committedly traveling with him. He has also struggled and suffered for the sake of the name of Christ, much like Paul had in Acts 19.29, the city of Ephesus when they had been shouting, great is Artemis of the Ephesians for two hours. In their anger, that they had grabbed certain men who Paul had ministered the word to and God had brought them to himself and says they took these men and dragged them into the theater. Gaius, Aristarchus were Macedonians who were accompanying Paul in his travels. You join up with Paul, you may face some of the problems he faces. You, you, you stand by him, before you know it, you may be imprisoned with him. You know, but that's in good company. Here's a fellow prisoner, and actually what's interesting here, and these are, these are challenging and fun things for those of us who study. 
This, this word here for fellow prisoner is not the common word for prisoner. It, it carries this sense. He's a fellow one taken by the spear. Which some, may, some speculate, maybe it's not referencing that he is necessarily imprisoned with Paul, but he has gone through persecution, problem, pain after pain with Paul. That a lot of the times when Paul was beaten with rods, uh-oh, his companions Aristarchus beaten with rods. Unquestionably, when Paul is shipwrecked, Aristarchus, who is traveling with him, is shipwrecked. Remember in some of those shipwrecks, they've gone days and nights without food, So in a sense, it may carry stronger the sense of not just fellow prisoner, but fellow sufferer. This happens. And I love the unity again that Paul puts into all of these things. Fellow sufferer, fellow uh, soldier, fellow worker, fellow servant. These terms keep coming. Then it says this also of Aristarchus, a Macedonian from Thessalonica. He greets you. Now, may not seem like much, and, and uh, you know, we don't want to read too much into it, but again, this is a different group, and Macedonians often would see themselves as different from those who were from Asia Minor. There would be some historic enmity and divisions among them. And this term greets you has its origin in the, in the notion of w- he embraces you. Takes you in his arms is the original sense of this word. And so again, it, it may be tying these ideas together. Another one who was at enmity with you. He greets you. He greets you in love. He embraces you. You know, it's, it's, a, it's a beautiful picture that is also there. Let's move on to the next one. Verse 10. And Mark, the cousin of Barnabas. Are you familiar with Mark, the cousin of Barnabas? I would hope so. We often will also refer to him as John Mark. We believe we have a gospel written by Mark. We also know probably more infamously that um, it says this in Acts chapter 12, verse 25, uh, Barnabas and Saul returned from Jerusalem when they had completed their service. Chapter 11 had said they were taking money and goods down to Judea for the saints there because of a famine that was taking place. They finished the delivery of those things and they came back to Antioch. When they came back to Antioch, John Mark came with them, bringing with them John, whose other name was Mark or Marcus in the Greek. And it says this, now Paul in Acts 13, 13 and his companions set sail from Paphos and came to Perga and Pamphylia. And John, that is John Mark, left them and returned to Jerusalem. So they go on their first missionary journey. John Mark is being brought along to assist them. And when they're early on, He leaves and goes to Jerusalem. Now we can ask a multitude of questions. Why? And our answer is, we don't know. And here I'm going to say this to you as a warning. The fact that we don't know is because the scripture do not tell us why. Does that stop men from speculating? Read yourself a commentary. You know, he may have received word that his mother was ill all right, I mean, may have, uh, why, I mean, they just start to think, what are all the possible reasons why he might have gone? And it's like, well, once you start speculating, you know, you could just go crazy. He may have caught, heard word that his mother grew wings. You know, that's ridiculous. Well, so is any other speculation we would make. It's ridiculous. Don't make it. If the scriptures say it, own it. If it doesn't say it, Be careful. We know he left. Maybe he faced an illness. Maybe he faced a hardship. We have no idea. This much we know. 
He started with them, and he left. This much we know further, Acts chapter 15. There arose a sharp disagreement between Paul and Barnabas so that they separated from each other. Barnabas took Mark with him and sailed away to Cyprus. They were going again on the next missionary journey. Barnabas wants to take Mark, John Mark. Paul does not. Now, here's the challenge. Would you say that Paul has some valid reasons, maybe, for not wanting him to take him, take him along? We took him last time, and he proved untrustworthy. He didn't have enough commitment. He didn't have enough endurance. In my estimation, unfit. Sweet Barnabas, son of encouragement, says what? Let's give him a go. You know, I think he may have grown. I think he may stay. Let, let's, let's do this, you know? And so they separate, and Barnabas goes with John Mark, and now Paul goes with Silas. And again, God uses both of them in the ministry, and we're thankful for that. But what I do want to bring to your attention is what it says in 2 Timothy Chapter 4, verse 11. Paul writes to Timothy and he says this, Luke alone is with me. Get Mark and bring him with you, for he is very useful to me in ministry. I think, isn't that beautiful? <laughs> you know, Barnabas was right. Paul was wrong. I'm thankful that Paul was able to recognize that he was wrong. And he saw the grace had brought growth in the life of this man, Mark. And here's what's interesting. The closing one at the end today, not far from now, is Demas. He's taken Demas, and Demas is now traveling along with him as an assistant, as an associate. And then Demas is going to prove to be unfaithful. So wait a second, are you saying that even an apostle, an experienced and trained man, sometimes his assessment and discernment of another could be off? Yes! So is it possible that at some time your and my assessment of an individual could be off? And here's what I want to note. He was still also looking at John Mark for what he was years before. Do you want to be judged by your worst seasons? Remembered by your most significant failures? Or do you hope and pray that God might by grace grow you and that not only would God grow you and use you, but you would hope and desire that your brothers and sisters might see that and welcome you and love you and accept you and participate with you. I mean, it's, it's an, just a beautiful picture. He is very useful to me. You know, and in my mind, I'm hoping Paul has done a lot of self-kicking how, how did I, do? I split with Barnabas over this. I would hope that he's had occasion to come to Barnabas with tears and embracing and say, brother, even as you showed me mercy and acceptance when none of the others would when I first came to Jerusalem, you showed him love and mercy when I wasn't. What grace God has given you to love the brethren and this love has proved valuable in this case. Let's go on. He tells them in this, this place, concerning whom you've received instruction, if he comes to you, welcome him. Not again knowing all the details, but apparently there's the possibility, hear the limited value of this, the possibility that they wouldn't welcome him. 
Now, if, if there's an uncertainty and, and the instruction to welcome him needs to be given, then it's possible in previous communication he's told them, let me tell you about our previous travels and experiences. Originally, I went on mission with Barnabas, and we took a few people with us. One of them, this guy John Mark, useless fella, deserted us. And in other words, is it possible, and I'm just saying this because I know it's possible with you and me, is it possible that Paul may have said things about John Mark that would make them less inclined to welcome him? It's possible only because he's making the express effort to say, welcome him. He's not saying welcome to Kikas. He's saying welcome him. And so, look, is it possible one time or another? Something may float out of our lips. Not so positive about somebody else that maybe painted them in a negative light. And maybe that negative light was exactly the light that we looked upon them at at that time. But is not the grace of God great? Could not people look upon Paul and say, persecutor of the church, blasphemer of the name of Christ? Could they not have? Would that have been false? It's absolutely true of who he was but not who he is. Praise God for great grace, growing grace, transforming grace, strengthening and enabling grace. Let's just roll on through. Actually, we won't roll on through. Someone, before I got up here, who will remain nameless, said, maybe you ought to only do half today. The one who gave such advice was a wise sage. And I will heed that advice because I don't want to miss some of the richness of this content. And I don't ever want to also just rush through these things without a careful consideration and application and seeing how it applies to how we live and how we think and how we love and how we speak, right? So thus far today, we've simply looked at tukikos, and, and, and when I read these terms, I hope they resonate with deeper than just a passing phrase. Beloved brother, faithful servant in the Lord, fellow slave in the Lord, an encouraging envoy. Onesimus, a faithful brother, a beloved brother, and a total teller also for encouragement. Aristarchus, a fellow prisoner or fellow sufferer, one who embraces you and greets you, sends in love. Mark, the cousin of Barnabas, and all of that hard history of which the grace of God was at work what a wonderful and rich thing may God grant us to consider these things apply them in our own lives and our love and our walk with one another let us pray Lord God I thank you for your word I thank you for even these sections that would oft seem to us to be those things that we just pass by but laced within them, you have some rich and deep truths. Lord, we thank you for the love that is ours in Christ Jesus. What a glorious thing it is to be beloved by God. Lord, we thank you that in that great work, you have also brought us into union with Christ, broken down hostility and that between men and men and brought us into the household of God where you give us a grace that overcomes all of those fleshly divisions to the where there is a depth of love and unity and service and willingness to self-sacrifice that transcends what the world would ever understand us doing for one another. Lord, we pray that you would work this grace in us. Lord, we pray uh, for those of us who have had seasons of shortcomings, stumblings, failures, and maybe even grievous sin. 
Lord, we thank you for your redemption. We thank you for your mercy. We thank you for the forgiveness and grace that is ours in Christ Jesus. And we pray that, Lord, in that great work of restoration and renewal, that you would restore broken relationships, that you would bring reconciliation, and not just surface level, but sincere, deep, and full of love. Lord, we thank you so much for those wonderful things in this passage that humble us, that unify us, that exalt you and engage us for your namesake in the lives of one another. In Jesus' name we pray, amen.